Hello? Is it working? Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this hybrid session, half here at Massport Venlo and half behind your screens. I don't know how it works, but I hope that there are a lot of people behind the screens now. So, very good to see you. We talk about circular economy this afternoon. There is no such thing as waste. There is only stuff in the wrong place. When I heard this sentence for the first time, that was somehow wow for me. It still is. It is still something to think about. We are living in times of big transitions. We have agro and food transition, the energy transition, mobility transition. So maybe circular economy will guide us through all these transition times. My name is Sonja Floto Stammen. I'm a member of the research group Business Innovation and I will guide you through this afternoon. And before we start with the official program, I want to ask our managing director Bram Ten Tenkate on stage to open the session. No, I, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> because of Corona, we have strong rules. <laughs> oh, so this is mine. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I just was sitting up there at the front, and uh, it feels like flying business class, isn't it? It's like I, I only had the experience of flying business class once in my life. It was just an upgrade, and I was still very young, and it felt like, oh. What a space, but it feels a little bit like that. And it also feels, to me personally, always very awkward, the situation that we're in. But really great to see uh, that, well, so many people are here in the room. And really great to see that the Massport is facilitating this in the way that we can do this in a live session. And also really great to know that the rest, a lot of people are online watching this. My name is Bram Ten Kaat, I'm Managing Director of the Campus here in Fontes uh, Venlo Campus here. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to open this session and, uh, on circular economy. Is this right? Yeah, this is our campus and our campus uh, I, I often show this campus uh, uh, to, to, to the outside world, this is what it looks like. 
and, uh, and then we say uh, also it's we, we are the only campus having a uh, direct access from the highway and it's the highway from Germany and uh, uh, so we, we're also in a process as a campus I can tell you of looking at a, a better position for us so, such that it's more into this time and that we can adhere to that we would like to be part of uh, the city and also with much more public transportation of course but this is where we are and uh, we see it as our um, we, we are in the business of uh, we teach students business technology and logistics uh, that's what happens on the campus and next to that we also have a special program for teachers in primary education and that is a very good m match with the needs of this region and we see it as our um, um, goal objective to prepare students for the careers that we have in this region and we attract a lot of international students actually and it's also a challenge to get these students and stay uh, here in this region because this is the target to get the students future proof and uh, in order to get students future proof that means that although we teach business we teach them a lot of circular economy business also more and more because that's not something special but it's something that should be in the genes of any business education program and also for technology students and for uh, logistics students because in any industry you see that we're working on this theme of sustainability so how do we get the students students uh, future proof um, we just started this year uh, and that's just a few days ago with the so-called business innovation learning lab and in this business innovation learning lab we actually do two things. We help the, uh, the at least two things. We help the, the regional companies where students work on assignments for these companies in the field of innovation. And we also make sure that our education stays up to date by working on the real assignments uh, from the companies. So also the uh, message out to all of you, uh, we are looking for companies who would like to partner with us. And if you look at the first group, and what they're working on then you see it's always a combination between business technology and sustainability that happens in all of these projects so it's in the core of what we do and we do this in the innovation center in this region greenport fenlo and isn't that great to do this in fenlo because for those who doesn't know do, uh, who doesn't know this building, but I see this always as the worldwide recognized icon for cradle to cradle. It's the uh, the city hall here in uh, in Venlo, and if you ever get the opportunity to visit it, for those who haven't done that, it's really amazing to see how it's constructed and how it works because everything in this building is. Uh, uh, recyclable, if that's an English term, you it's actually pretty much labeled so you know where it should go when the building is decomposed and uh, the, the city of Fenlo won many 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 awards and I recently had a presentation from an entrepreneur in the field of sustainability he says I was just delivering my presentation in Mexico and the speaker just before me in Mexican actually started with the first slide and what was on the first slide that was this so it's great to have this in the in the in the the city of Venlo as an icon for uh, sustainability, circular economy. We are a university of applied sciences. That means that our research aims at applying new knowledge. We are an applied science research uh, university and we prepare students in applying these uh, uh, new insights. And this means we have two uh, uh, research groups. It's the research group uh, in business innovation and um, uh, Jean-Louis Stevens, where is Jean-Louis? Jean-Louis Stevens is the research lead of the uh, research group business innovation. And we have, we have cross-border uh, sustainable business uh, development. Uh, is the sustainable in addition? Vincent Feinberg, or is it just for now? It's a cross, cross uh, it's one of the topics we focus on. It's the cross-border business development. And the two research groups, it's great to see how it works because they kind of overlap. 
because we're in the midst of cross-border business development and we're in the midst of business innovation. And that's a combination that we use for helping companies in this region. And when we say region, we always talk about the EU region, which is the Dutch as well as the German side. And that is the reason, of course, why I speak English at this moment. <laughs> But I think every, there was the instruction, everything should be in English. So I hope you all enjoy a very uh, nice day uh, today, evening. And uh, I would like to give the uh, floor back to Sonja Flotestammen. Sonja, thank you. Thank you very much, Bram. So um, as I said, we have a hybrid session here. So um, due to Corona, we have to be flexible with our guest speakers. Um, we invited four guest speakers and uh, we managed to get them all here, but not personally, physically, but two, from, two of them will speak to us on screen. And this is where we now start with. We start with a screen guest lecture, guest presentation, speech. <laughs> Um, circular economy and the circularity gap of Tamara Feldbur. Um, I'm not sure, can we see her on screen also or I guess we just see the presentation then. But um, uh, Tamara Feldbur, yes, hello. Yeah. Okay, hi. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> that is <laughs> That's nice. That's already a good start. Um, so, Tamara Feldbur, she um, will talk about um, her experience with circular economy and she is a consultant. She's well known, or what she wrote is well known, um, the research on the circular economy gap. There is a report published on this. Um, so, I'm sure she will uh, tell something about the results in this report. Um, so she's advisor, consultant for companies, and um, we will learn the latest um, state-of-the-art, I guess, development of circular economy in our economy. So Tamara Feldbur, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. It's kind of a new experience to know that I'm speaking to a lot of you and that you're all sitting there while I'm sitting here in my living room in Amsterdam. And I'm very excited to be talking to you today on behalf of my organization or my, the organization I work for called Circle Economy and then specifically indeed the Circularity Gap Report. So as a short uh, introduction, Circle Economy is an impact organization and what that means is that basically we are focused on turning the circular economy concept into practical solutions. And we do that uh, via working with businesses, national governments and cities. Now, and as part of the work we do, we also do research and we try to bring the narrative on the circular economy forward. And to that end, uh, we launched the first circularity gap report in 2018 because we recognized a need for a metric that could lead impactful action and that could help drive the narrative on the potential solution that the circular economy um, gives. Uh, and what the report does is it provides insight into the circular state of the world, but beyond just giving a number, it then also dives into specific aspects of circularity, which could be an industry focus or a country specific perspective and it tries to explore potential pathways on how we can close the circular circularity gap that we still see in the world today. Now, before I will actually share with you what that circularity number or circle and in the inverse the circularity gap is, uh, I will first talk you through uh, the why we actually need a circular economy. So what is the challenge we're facing? the theory behind it, and then on to the benefit it brings, because in the end it's a means to an end. And then I will finally give you the, the circularity number that we uh, have calculated, and, uh, but then to end on a positive note, also share with you the, the solution that we see through some practical examples also. 
Now, to start with the challenge, and the first picture already uh, gives a bit of a clue of what the challenge is related to. So the, what the graph here on the screen shows is basically that since the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution, around 200 years ago, we have seen an exponential growth in our economy, and that has brought us a lot of prosperity. And all that was uh, partly the result to, due to, to the extraction of resources. So where the white line represents the GDP growth, and I'm not sure if you can also see my cursor moving, uh, the blue line follows a similar trend. It goes upwards, and that is the material extraction. Now, we only show these two lines, but basically it will be the same if you would plot CO2 emissions, water extraction, also population growth there. Now, the challenge that we're facing and why we're bringing this graph up in our stories is that basically what we want to do is to enable to meet the needs, the social needs of a growing group of people. But at the same time, we want to limit or even stop the material uh, extraction. Now, why do we want to stop this still increasing rate of resource extraction? That is because this is increasingly testing the natural boundaries of our system. And basically, you could say roughly before the uh, industrial evolution, our system was in balance. So we would extract resources from the earth, but it, we would also give it back. And at least we didn't extract resources quicker than we, uh, the natural world could regenerate them. But now, since we are doing that for a couple of years, we run into uh, events such as extreme weather events, what we can see from the in increasing uh, number of flash floods, we see increases in air pollution, although over the past months, of course, that has slowed down a bit, but also temperature records that are being broken year on year. Now we can ask ourselves, why is that a problem? Well, that is because, for example, to stick with the, uh, with the temperature rise, that has knock-on effects. So if temp global temperature rises, for example, the sea temperature rises, and that might have a negative effect on the corals that are in there or the species that live in there, and since they are also part of the ecosystem we live in, that is eventually also detrimental to, uh, to, to us humans. But then these problems aren't only far away, and it's not only, for example, vulnerable island states that uh, suffer from these extreme weather events, but it's also happening around the corner, for example, in Groningen. And so here the uh, resource extraction is natural gas, and that resulted in physical damage, for example, like to this, uh, to this house, but also it brings a lot of social stress, to say the least. So these are just a couple of examples of what could happen when a system is out of balance, and also why it's necess necessary to restore that balance. But beyond the environmental and social risks that we face, there is also an economical threat if we keep doing business the way we currently do. Now, research by uh, my organization has also identified a couple of so-called linear risks. And basically what we have found uh, or tried to capture in that research is that companies who continue to operate like they used to do, they utilize non-renewable resources. However, the risk associated with that is that they, these might come short in supply and it might bring price volatility or disruptions in supply chain. Or if you prioritize the sale of new products, which is basically a sales uh, throughput model where products end up in waste, that is also not a, not a system that is fit for, for, the current, uh, for the current time anymore. And other problems that we see is that there is a failure to collaborate and a failure to innovate or adapt. Now, if businesses continue with these practices, they also increase their exposure to disruption. And moreover, even if they wouldn't be triggered by these kind of ri risks, what's more is that pollutive and non-sustainable practices increasingly play a role in the public perception. We, in our role as consumers, want companies to take their responsibility. Now, if we then move to the theory behind the circular economy, we always start by describing the current system as a linear model. 
So what that means is that basically we source raw materials from the earth, we turn those into products that we sell on the market, they are used, and by the time they are no longer useful, they end up either in incineration or landfill. So basically, what we say is that, and of course not all companies do that, but still, to a large extent, products seem to be made without thinking what happens to it when a product, product no longer is of use to someone. And maybe even worse, some products are made with the knowledge that they will break in time, so that consumers have to buy new products. And this is called plant obsolescence. But then on the, on the flip side of this linear economy comes the circular economy. So what we believe is that we should all move to this system where we continue to loop all the products and materials in the economy and thereby maintain value. So at the core, the smaller the circle, the better it fits the principles of a circular economy. So basically, you prevent products from ending up in waste and you try to maintain them through proper repair and care. And maybe when you no longer see a use of it, you try to share it and resell it to someone else who can reuse it. So basically, the core element of this model is that the smaller the loop, the better it is because you keep a product as close to its original utility. So that means that no extra resources are needed to bring it uh, into the economy again. So the circular economy is about designing out waste and also about regenerating natural ecosystems. Now, in essence, the circular economy is not something new. It builds on the shoulders of giants. And basically, we could even say that it has been around for at least 40 years uh, when sustainability thinking came up. So you see a number of great resources here on the slide. And so we start with the limits to growth. That was a report by the Club of Rome, who stated that with the current developments, or at that time, in the early 70s, already then they signaled that there are limits to growth because we are basically limited by the planetary resources that we have at our disposal, and we have to be careful with them. Then a bit later, in 1976, the term circular economy was first described by the Swiss professor Walter Stahel, and he spoke about an economy in circles. Now, there's a couple of more examples on here, uh, and the one that is not even mentioned here, but that is maybe the almost the newest edition, is the Donut Economics, so where the uh, economist Kate Rayworth describes the outer boundaries of our planet and the inner boundaries of societal needs. So that is something that we often refer to when we speak about the circular economy. Now, as already mentioned briefly at the start, the circular economy is a means to an end. Now, what do we mean by that? So, most importantly and urgently at this time is probably the positive contribution it can uh, it can give to mitigate climate impact. So basically, we have to bring our way of living and working back in line to limit the global temperature rise to the one and a half degree uh, commitment, like uh, the national governance made by the Paris Agreement. And while there are some national commitments already, uh, research has shown that it won't add up to, uh, to meet the one and a half degree commitment. But then if you bring in the circular economy, that can bring a, a big benefit as well in limiting CO2 emissions. And this is due partly because, uh, as explained previously, if you keep products and materials in use, you prevent uh, extra CO2 emissions needed to produce new products or extract new materials from the earth or the transportation that is needed to move products from one side of the earth to the other. But it's not only CO2 emissions that it can contribute to. The circular economy is also a positive narrative when it comes to jobs and the social side. So by the example that you see on the screen here, it shows that for a piece of, uh, of textile, textiles, if it would end up in waste, that would only uh, give one person a job. Compared to all the way on the other side, if you would reuse a piece of clothing, that would in total involve 296 jobs. 
So I think that's quite a powerful example to show why we should move from wasting resources to keeping them in use. And then finally, the percentage that I promised you at the start, how circular is our world today then? I have one more slide in between before I show you uh, the number that we came up with. Uh, I want to show you this very colorful picture, which is a representation of the global metabolism, or basically how materials flow through our global economy. On the left hand side, you see the four main resource groups, and so the materials that are extracted from the earth, how they are flowing through the economy from taking them out of the earth, processing them into products, and then providing them to uh, us uh, to meet our societal needs. And uh, so it shows that approximately we, we use, or no, we extract close to 100 billion tons of raw materials each year. And so to give a couple of examples, the minerals, uh, those are mainly used in construction. So basically they meet the societal need of housing. And biomass is uh, the one here at the bottom, the green line. Those are the resources extracted that are uh, primarily directed towards providing our societal need of nutrition. And then there's a share of materials that flows back each year. And currently, we estimate that there's a 9% circularity. So what that means is that from all the resources extracted, that currently only 9% flows back into our global system. So on the flip side, that means that 91% of resources are still lost. Now, it depends per person how low or in line with your expectations this number is, but I think that the good thing is that it also shows enough opportunity for us to close the gap. And with that, uh, I want to add uh, a little bit of nuance because where that number shows uh, the amount of materials that cycle, an important distinction that we make is between products that flow, and these are products that are typically used, consumed within the time span of a year, versus products that last. And with products that last, you can think of large uh, things such as buildings or equipment, and basically those things where materials are, as we say, put in stock. So they won't become available to reuse for, uh, for quite some time in terms of housing, if I look at the environment I live in, it could even be hundreds of years. So to add to the picture that I showed before showing the percentage, in the top left corner you can still see the global metabolism, but as you can see there's also a large amount of materials that are put into stock, as just mentioned. And so basically over all the years that we've been extracting materials, what you can see is we've had an enormous buildup of stock. And so the most important message that I want to uh, give here is that it's also important to make better use of that which we already have. And that brings us to the solution and also the last part of my presentation. So the circular economy as a solution, how does it bring a solution? Basically, we can uh, sum it up in three ways, cycle, slow, narrow. So what we can do to bridge the circularity the gap is we can cycle our resources, which basically means high-end uh, second life of products and materials, for example, through reuse or eventually also recycling of materials. Slowing flows is about extending the, the useful life and using them longer and better. And finally, narrowing flows or reducing the amount of materials that we use to deliver the same amount of benefits to the user. And here you can think of virtualization or dematerialization. Now, a model that we use at Circle Economy is called the seven key elements. So uh, what these are are basically seven uh, elements that we came across when we reviewed publications eight years ago when we were founded. And this is basically 
basically the language that organizations of all types use when they speak about the circular economy. And so basically these are strategies that you could pursue if you want to incorporate a circular economy into your organization. I will explain them one by one by giving a practical example. Starting with prioritize regenerative resources. So here it's all about ensuring that you use renewable, reusable or non-toxic resources. And all in an efficient way, of course. The example here is Hemelswater. It's uh, a Dutch beer and basically they collect rainwater and then use that rainwater to produce beer. Use waste as a resource, maybe one of the most well understood examples of a circular economy when it talks about waste no more. So here it's looking at what might now be considered a waste stream, how that can become a resource. And so in this specific example, we are looking at stone cycling. So it's basically recycled bricks. They are made from construction waste. And the ambition of this company is to turn waste into unique and beautiful spaces. Another strategy is to extend what's already made. And so here it's about maximizing the life cycle of a product that is already manufactured. And so uh, here it's all about the embedded resources. So there's already a lot of time and energy that's been put into producing this product. So how can you make sure that it stays usable for the maximum amount of time? And this is a Philips MRI scanner. So I'm sure you will hear more about it uh, when Thijs will share his story. Uh, so therefore, on to the next strategy, which is about rethinking the business model. And here it's about creating greater value and aligning incentives of multiple players in the value chain. So here you can specifically think about how can we find interaction between products and services. And the example here is from bundles. So instead of selling a washing machine, they sell a clean wash. So you just pay per wash and they keep an eye out on the product and make sure that it's serviced on time and that parts are replaced before it can break. And so it becomes um, more cheaper and more affordable for a large group of people. And then collaborate to create joint value. So here the example is by Rotterswan. This is a company based in Rotterdam and they grow oyster mushrooms on coffee grounds. So here how they collaborate, it's with restaurants and nearby businesses where they collect the coffee grounds. They then grow oyster mushrooms on them. And then those oyster mushrooms are, for example, turned into bitter ballen that are then sold back to the restaurants. Then an example on design for the future. So here it's about already at the start when you think about creating a product, how can it at the end of its useful life either be uh, made fit for repair or recycling or how can you upgrade it easily so that it still stays relevant. So uh, here with, with Fairphone, uh, the main example that we, we can see on screen here is that they really had the modular design in mind. So where a normal smartphone uh, tends to be outdated after two years, through their mod modular approach, it's possible to just upgrade that part of the phone that becomes outdated instead of having to throw away your full phone. And then finally, but probably very relevant uh, in today's world and what we can also see today by uh, some of us attending remotely, it's uh, how can we leverage digital technology for a circular economy. So here it's about strengthening connections between the supply chain by, for example, using digital online platforms and technologies. And uh, the example here is by DHL. So how can they use digital technology to prevent having empty trucks drive through a city? So can it be smart about not only bringing resources somewhere or products somewhere, but also can it take products back?
So this was uh, my story about the circular economy, the circularity gap that we're facing, and also some solutions on how we can bridge that gap. So before closing, there's a, a final kick that I want to share with you. When I'm thinking about a circular economy, what I always keep in mind is that in the end, we can't do it without collaboration. We need to recognize that any circular ambition, whether it's on a personal level or on a company level, we have to work together. It's all about innovation and especially in a, in a business and student environment, I think that is a word that always resonates. But whether it's radical or incremental innovation, whether it's focused at the process level or at the product level, what's important is to look at things with a fresh perspective. Turn them upside down and start seeing and valuing waste as a resource. And finally, it asks for a bit of confidence from all of us. And whether it's at your personal level, where you can think, what can I do to make the circular economy a reality? As a professional, a student, or whether you're a leader, we all have to be confident that collectively we can boost our capacity and capability to better serve our societal needs in a more sustainable way, where we protect the natural ecosystem that we are a part of. Finally, we always invite everyone to join us in this conversation via our website circularity-gap.world. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tamara Feldbo. That was really nice, a very um, deep overview of the whole topic. Really interesting facts. What I remember especially is the 296 jobs for reusing a t-shirt, for example, or clothes. Um, that is a little bit some, or it is something we should talk about in our business classes because very often it is said that there are um, jobs, uh, that we lose jobs if we reuse things too often. So that was a really nice one. And also what I like very much, um, the number, the 9%, because now we come to, um, to a measurement of circularity. And this is, of course something we need to compare and to have better facts about what are we doing with this circul circularity, circular economy, so that we have a measurement and we, you come up with 9%. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you very much so far. And we go on now with a live speaker. Um, we have Roy Fissers from a multinational from DSM. And we are very happy that you are here today. I guess um, Roy wants to start with a film, with a video. So as soon as I leave the stage, I guess the video starts. There's one thing I believe in, and that's our ability to adapt to our environment, to transform in order to survive. Look at this company. What started from harvesting coal in the mines became petrochemicals. At the time, it was a necessary solution to the demands of a growing population. But as life changes, needs change. So it was time for them to change as well. Exactly. What was once a, a local coal mining company, they've grown to become a global science player in health, nutrition and materials. Through this transformation, the company flourished. The challenges of nutrition and climate change and managing the Earth's resources can't be solved with just governments alone. We need these companies with the technological expertise and innovative power to provide answers. That's why DSM has decided to take the ultimate step in their transformation. It's what they've been building towards over the past century. Arrived at the true purpose of the company. The reason for their existence. To create brighter lives. For all. And with one in four people across the world already benefiting from their products, I believe they can do exactly that. From the dark tunnels of the Dutch state mines, 
something beautiful arose, a love for our world and humanity expressed through science, balancing profitable growth with playing a positive role in the world. Using bright science to create solutions for people today and generations to come. Healthy living, a stable climate, and a bio-based circular economy for all. I believe it's possible. And I'm not the only one. The microphone is on. I think you can hear me. I'm uh, very excited to be here today. Um, I've been on stage in many countries around the world, actually from London to New York, from Tokyo to Berlin. And I'm very excited and honored that I'm here today in, uh, in my hometown, Statue van Law and Plaisir. And I'm here today to tell you a little bit about the sustainability journey for DSM. Um, Dutch state mines, the Staatsmijnen. I think many of you still, especially here in the south of, uh, of the Netherlands, know DSM as, a, as that chemical company. So maybe it's good before I start my presentation to also start a little bit at the beginning. DSM originated as a coal mining company, um, and I think we just saw that in the presentation of Tamara as well. That's all about resources, resource extraction. But we evolved, DSM evolved into chemical specialties. And now it's a company in nutrition, health, and sustainable living. And if you look at the company DSM today, it's about 10 billion in sales. It's global presence. And it's partly materials. That's one third of the business. And the rest is actually nutrition. And that's animal nutrition. That's human nutrition. That's health food specialties. That's personal care. And if you look at the figures, you see that 43% of the sales are actually to high growth economies. And interesting, and that's what I like also to, to tell about DSM, it's all about evolving. So one fifth of the sales are actually from innovations, which means that effectively every five years, there's a whole new product portfolio. And we are a company with a purpose. And if you look at our global presence, you see that DSM it's all about that. It's our employees are all across the world. And actually, the largest part, the majority of the people work outside of Europe. And the, the question I get most, and, and I think Heineke uh, will explain, Philip will explain, that are all brands everybody knows. You know what kind of products they sell. People always ask, what are the products that DSM is making? And without you knowing, all of you are actually using DSM products. And maybe since this is a small group and, and it's an interactive session, I want to do that experiment. I can tell you what we do, but maybe let's do that experiment. So people that, let's say, have an Apple iPhone, please raise your hand. Who of you has an Apple iPhone? Right, that's already about half of the people here. There's DSM material in. Do any of you, again, please raise your hand, ever use supplement vitamin pills? Let's say vitamin C to abuse your immunity. Again, quite a few people, right? Who of you ever use sun protection in the last six months? There you go. And I can go on. DSM is an ingredient brand, and we are in many, many different applications. A lot of it is in food, uh, and you think about cheese, yogurt, but also if you talk about fish, eggs, even meat, there's examples where DSM is providing nutritional products somewhere in that chain. Before I move on to what we do at DSM in sustainability, <clears throat> I like to start, and this is my favorite slide, a little bit um, from where we're coming from. And actually 10 years ago, and maybe since this slide is already 
one year old and the people online, uh, people here in, in the room, I think you all like that, 11 years ago. It was a choice that was forced upon DSM to make between doing something good for the planet, doing something good for society, and doing good financially. And DSM showed that it's not necessary to make that choice. DSM showed that it's possible to do financially well and do something good for society, do something good for the planet. And we take it one step further, because we think that in 10 years from now, 11, it's no longer a choice. This is essentially license to operate for every business. If you do not prove that you're doing something good for society, if you cannot show that your products have an environmental benefit, you might be out of business. And we already see the examples from shareholders that invest in DSM because of our sustainability portfolio. We get a lot of questions from shareholders that ask us, can't you do more? And this, this is where we're heading. And I hope that more companies will join us. So we are a company that's led by purpose, purpose-led, performance-driven. And we have a reputation in sustainability. And one of that is, of course, we've been leading the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for over a decade. We're ranked number one sustainalytics. We've been in the list of companies that change the world from Fortune. And the list goes on. So I'm not going to read it out to you, but I hope that you now see DSM is no longer that chemical company on Camelot. We're really a company on a with a purpose. We're a company with a mission. That purpose is to create brighter lives for all. And with that, with the examples I just mentioned, we reach two and a half billion people annually. When DSM updated its strategy in 2018, the first thing that we did is we looked at the outside world. And usually when, when companies revise their strategy, the first thing they do is they look at themselves. But we didn't do that. The first thing we did is we looked at what are some of the global challenges, what are the biggest societal needs in the upcoming years. And that's why we want to build our strategy around. And these are a few of those figures. And the, the 821 million, that's actually 821 million people that suffer from hunger. Every day, men and women have, are struggling feeding their children with nutritious meals. 821 million people go to bed on an empty stomach, while at the same time, 600, 650 million people are living with obese in a world where there's enough food to feed everybody. This is a global challenge. The 140 million, and I don't have to tell you, climate change is going to impact all of us. And the 140, 140 million is a number of people that could be forced to migrate due to climate change. And we already know that this number has grown in the last year. And then the 400%, that's all about the demand for resources. And we know that we are taking more from this planet every year than it can replenish. And by 2050, we are heading towards an overuse of the Earth's capacity by over 400%. So what we did is we look at, looking at those societal challenges, we also looked at what are now sustainability topics. And sustainability topics, there's not just one. The United Nations developed the Sustainable Development Goals. Those are 17 of those goals. And we focus on five of them, looking at those societal needs that we think we can impact some way or another. And which actually resulted in what we call our three focus domains. These are the growth opportunities for DSM. And we are using our core competences to address those societal needs. And what you're looking at here is really the heart of DSM strategy. So there's three domains. One is nutrition and health. That's linked to SG2, SG3. And this is about developing those solutions for nutrition, uh, solutions for healthcare. It can be around people with diabetes, providing solutions there. This is also a lot about food, uh, trying to tr prevent food loss and waste. Um, uh, Africa-improved food for areas where they need development. 
The other one is climate and energy. That has to do with our own carbon footprint, but a lot of that's also about developing solutions for our customers that help them create a lower footprint. And lastly, and I'm a little bit biased here because I'm responsible for the last domain, uh, maybe the most complex one, it's a resources circularity. It's the newest one. And that for us, it's about essentially moving away from fossil raw materials to more renewable ones. Making products out of waste, but also rethinking our own products. How can we redesign our products that they don't end up as waste? So I told you about the why, the societal needs. I told you about the what, and those are actually the three domains. And this is a little bit the how. So for all we do, we want to improve, starting with DSM, starting with ourselves, improving our own carbon footprint, improving our own raw materials. Instead of buying virgin, why don't we use secondary raw materials? Look at any of the materials. Do they have hazardous substances? Let's phase them out. Let's see if there's alternative that is safer than the one that we now buy. Secondly, enable. And this, has, again, has to do with our product portfolio. We can only win in a society that is playing along in sustainability. So we want to enable our customers and their customers and eventually the persons that are using our products to become more sustainable. And the way we want to do that is also to advocate, is to take the stage. To take the stage and really be that leader in, in sustainability and making sure that the industry follows. Combined, that is what we call a brightening living agenda. So these, is the, these are the three domains, and these are the improve and able advocate. And before I deep dive into the circularity part of DSM, um, I want to quickly add, underline the urgency to move towards a circular economy. And when we started to discuss circular economy at DSM, I think there was about one report written from the Alan McCarthy Foundation. And only last year, a whole bunch of new reports underlining, addressing that urgency were published. So please don't believe me, read one of those reports and, <laughs> and see for yourself. This is the way, we the way forward and we should all understand why we need to go there. So for DSM circularity, it means a couple of things. It means enabling circular bioway solutions but also means improving our own efficiency. It, it means improving yields, reducing food loss and waste, developing solutions that will reduce food loss and waste. But it's also about preserving land and marine biodiversity. And the one not mentioned here is, of course, the most obvious one. It's a lot about waste. If we look at circularity for DSM, we have introduced five pillars. And those five pillars are the uh, core strategy, circularity strategy for DSM. So for all, we do, for all we do at DSM, we look at those five drivers and we start always with reduce. Reducing the use of critical raw materials, but also overthinking. Can we make a material simpler? Can we use different materials? Do we need to use that much packaging? Can we replace packaging so that we don't need that anymore? We want to replace scarce materials, hazardous materials, potentially harmful resources with renewable ones. We have a whole product line that we're switching from fossils to now biomass. That's just one of the examples and how we think we can improve our own. Actually, replacing materials is the first step for DSM in many, many cases in, uh, in the circularity. Then the other one is, it's always a very obvious one, but I think it's good to mention, it's about extending the lifetime of products. For all we do, we, make, we have to make sure that we develop products that last. And it starts, um, of course, and people here all familiar with Cradle to Cradle, a lot of it starts with design. Right? As Michael Borngard said, we don't have a waste problem, we have a design problem. I think that's very much true. First thing is also to have a look at the design of our products. How can we design products in a way that they don't have to end up as waste? Can we make them simpler? 
Can we make them reversible, designed for recyclability? And the last one, it's about recovery. Um, and for us, that is about using waste as an input for new products. And we have an example I want to show you later on in how we think we can do that. So these are a few of the examples for DSM. Um, so we are pioneering bio-based material. An example is, uh, is Decovery. It's a plant-based high-performance resin. It's a paint. Um, replaces, of course, paint from, made from fossils. This is safer material. There are uh, no hazardous substances in compared to uh, usual paint. It's made from a plant instead of from oil. Second one is discarded fishing nets, and I have, a, I have a short example of this one later on. Some of you already know Niaga. Um, it's an example of the carpet industry, an uh, example of a product where we use a reversible adhesive um, to make the carpet, the, the top separable from the backing, which makes the carpet fully recyclable. And normally carpets uh, end up in landfill because you cannot recycle them. And I think the last bucket here is we want to enable that transition. So we want to be a front runner, but we want everybody to play along because it's not fun in a game if we are the only ones. So we really want to enable that circle economy for the whole industry. Circle economy is a value chain transition, uh, but it also requires partners. And here's a few of them that we're partnering up with. And uh, circle economy is one of them they presented uh, but that's just one of the few, I think the World Economic Forum, people know that here, uh, but also PACE, Platform Accelerating Circular Economy. We cooperate with Philips, we cooperate with other companies in this. Um, and we support initiatives like the ocean cleanup. They collect plastic out of the ocean, and we're trying to see how we can use that plastic out of the ocean to make new products again. So to summarize, we cannot do this alone. We, we do this together with our employees with our customers, with our suppliers, with our shareholders, and we do this for society. That's the purpose that we have. So many of the examples that DSM has on circularity is actually on the material side. And I thought it was good to also show some examples in nutrition. And this is Bovair. Um, and this is a product um, uh, it's, it's a feed for cows and 14.5%, and you can read it here, of the human-caused greenhouse gases come from livestock. 65% um, of that actually comes from beef, cattle and dairy. And a large proportion of that emission come from enteric methane, burp. And uh, what we did is we created a product, so it's a feed supplement that actually reduces that emission with 30%. So with the same stock of cows for dairy, we actually have 30% lower emission. Another example is Canola Pro. And for this, we use waste. It's a byproduct of rapeseed oil. And we use that to create a plant-based protein. It's a very high nutritional product. Uh, it has very low carbon footprint, and it has excellent properties. So we are very proud of these examples. We can make products out of waste, which still have great properties, still great functionalities. And this is, we can make money with waste. And I already showed you, this is the Niaga example, the carpet. We also apply this in mattresses. So carpet, mattresses, those are the number one and two products that end up in landfill. Not because they don't have valuable uh, materials in it, but because people are not able to recycle them. We create this reverse what e-sift, actually making it possible to recycle carpet, to recycle mattresses. It doesn't have to end up in landfill. So we're not making a product different. We're making the way it's made different. And this is the last example. I don't know if we have sound, but I have to check this out.
nowadays when I'm out paddling, I have to fill my balls of plastic all the time. Being uh, lucky enough to both uh, be on the water the whole time and produce uh, gear, we put it together and see how we can really change the way the industry is thinking about producing products. Our mission is just to showcase that change can happen really quick and it's super urgent. We are uh, using uh, the um, Arcelon uh, upcycle fishing nets for uh, uh, all inserts, for the leash plugs, for the pin boxes, pins and pumps for our inflatable boards. So in the future we will have pretty much all uh, plastic components uh, in uh, this material. It's just too much fun to know that our world champions can go out there. They can win championships uh, with uh, parts of the products being all fishing nets. That makes you feel happy, you know. These things are possible now. Well, I can go on for a full day in explaining what other nice things we do at DSM, but I'm I was asked to give a presentation, and I think I'm already running over time looking at Vincent here. Um, but please, uh, let this be an invite for all of you. If you're students or either business, please reach out to us. If you think you can be part of our sustainability journey, if you have to offer us something or you want to ask us something, please do so. So if you are looking for an internship, don't hesitate. Please re reach out. If you think you have a solution or you may have a product that's interesting for us, please reach out because essentially circular economy is a value chain effort, effort and we can only do that by collaborating. Um, and for the rest, I hope uh, this story inspired you a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy Fissas. That was really great, so many uh, examples. Um, really great examples. You seem to cover all the sectors. Um, there was from food to all kinds of different sectors which are covered by DSM. So I'm sure that students behind the screens will be interested now. Um, we will come back later to this and now we go on with the um, program online, so we have another um, speaker online. Um, but first, I would like to invite all the speakers on stage now, because we uh, combine it and mix it with the podium discussion now. So um, please come on stage, um, Roy Fissers and Anne Dubost. Maybe I have to introduce her first. Um, we will have now one more speaker online, that is Thijs Martens from Philips, and we will have Anne Dubost from Heineken. And I'm not 100% sure who will start now with a short presentation because we didn't decide it yet. It is Anne. <laughs> um, so, we go to another um, industry, we go to food and beverage, and we would like to know from a multinational perspective again what is going on in circular economy at Heineken. Good afternoon, everyone, here and online. So, yeah, I will just shortly, to set the context, explain what circular economy means uh, for us at Heineken. I guess you all know what we do, we brew beer. Um, so, uh, for us, circular economy, we have to consider, because we make a beverage product, like you say, we have to consider the difference between the biological materials coming in 
and out of our value chain versus the technical materials. And uh, the big main source of waste within our whole value chain is actually the co-products that come directly on our breweries around the world, uh, and most of this is uh, organic, and the packaging material that some end up in our brewery, but many end up in your hands after you finished drinking the beer and you have to dispose it or return it. And the last uh, thing I want to mention is that uh, we have 165 breweries in 70 countries around the world, so we really have to find solutions that work to become more circular in all these locations. Uh, so the first one I mentioned is the, the waste we generate in our own breweries, and we have a zero waste ambition for this location. So before, uh, just to give you an idea of what, what these residual materials are, it's uh, mostly brewer's grain. So it's the leftover grain after we do the brewing process. Uh, and then surplus yeast, other co-products, the sludge and the kistel gore, all of these are organic materials. And they have uh, nutritional values and benefit, proteins, fiber. So we try to find uh, a second life for them and a, a good outlet for them. And the other one are, yeah, direct packaging material waste and some other small quantity of hazardous material. And maybe one to mention is the spent alcohol, which is the new kind of the block, as you might know the new Heineken 00, and all the no alcohol beer we produce, where we take out the beer, the alcohol from the beer, so we are left with this alcohol, and we can do a lot of cool stuff with it, actually. Uh, so what we try is uh, eliminate landfill completely and go always higher in our waste hierarchy and we have been working at that. So we have been measuring and uh, looking at destinations since 2014, but actually we have been working on circularity since Heineken exists, which is 1864. Uh, and I give three examples of that. So the first one is... Um, the brewer's grain, so this 71% you saw before. Uh, so this is not Heineken who invented it, but uh, for centuries this has been a practice that this grain is going to cattle feed. It's a very good source of uh, fibers for them. And Heineken, when they started, also started doing it. The second example is the returnable glass bottles. And you probably all know it. When you go to Albertine, you drink your beer and I hope you then buy returnable bottles and return them afterwards. And this is actually one of the only few now products uh, that is returnable in a supermarket. And it used to be barrels. We also have the kegs uh, in, the, in the bars and the bottles for you as a consumer in the supermarket. And the final example is the Wobo bottle. I don't know if many of you heard of it. It doesn't exist anymore, but in the 60s, Freddie Heineken, uh, so the challenge of bottle ending up in the sea or in landfill and he saw the challenge of housing in some uh, of our markets uh, that was in the Caribbean islands. So he thought what if we could use our bottle once they are drunk as construction material, as bricks. So they designed this new bottle, the Wobo, they made 10,000 uh, examples. But it didn't... In the end, it didn't go through because it was creating a lot of heat in the house, but you can still see it at the Heineken experience, and he still built his own garden shed uh, in the Netherlands uh, of these Wobo bottles. And maybe another example I want to mention here is Mexico, because um, like I will say later, we're on, still early on our journey of circular economy and our thinking. But our operating company, Heineken Mexico, ha is much more advanced than already in 2014, 2015. They started really uh, changing their business model around circular economy. They became a member of uh, CE100, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and they trained more than 3,000 of their people in all functions on circular economy and really went ahead. And we're now taking all these learnings and experience to apply it in the global company. So another message, I saw Roy, you have a similar slide, but we can't do it alone. And I think that was also a message from Tamara. So yeah, I think the slide talks for itself, but we need to work with all these stakeholders. Uh, 
yeah, we, be it our suppliers or our farmers or food materials or packaging suppliers, the waste management company that take care of our waste downstream, and startups and scale-ups for innovation. Uh, peers industry, like other uh, peers in Netherlands, or this circular economy network that's like C100, where we're also a member. And yeah, our retailers and consumers, you, because we also need you to make circular economy a reality for Heineken. And finally, yeah, government, NGOs, universities, so like today, and the local communities in these 70 countries. And I have just a few examples, maybe I'm not gonna mention all of them for time, but this is one example where we sell our surplus yeast after production in UK to Unilever, and they make Marmite out of it, because our yeast has a lot of protein, and it's the main ingredient for the Marmite, not sure if you have tasted it. So that's made with our yeast. This example is Solomon Island, where uh, surplus yeast is very good for pig feed, but the local pig farmers were not convinced. So we, Heineken bought their own Heineken piglets and gave them to the farmer to feed our yeast to them to show them that they grow better. And then uh, finally they were sold and they started using our yeast to feed their own pigs. This one is in Mexico where we use Kisolgo, which is a, a filtration agent we use in the brewing process. Uh, we use it to make bricks. We mix it with clay and with these bricks we create cooking stoves. Yeah, and examples where we use sludge from our wastewater treatment plants to make fertilizers. And yeah, I will skip the last one. And my last slide is to, yeah, we want it to be open because like I said, we are, we are currently in a phase of uh, writing the next chapter for Heineken uh, Sustainable Development Strategy. And, um, and yeah, I'm calling out actually for your inputs and suggestions and feedback. Our main challenge today is the mindset and responsibility within the organization because we have functions, they all have a role to play, but it's the governance and the ownership of circular economy is always a challenge. Where, where does it sit? Who is responsible for it? We all are, but how do we actually make it happen in the company? The second challenge is the scale because we have a lot of stories around the world, but how can we scale it or replicate? It's, it has been a challenge sometimes to convince other countries or bring the same idea to other places in the world. The third one, uh, which keeps me awake at night, is how do we measure our progress? So I'm curious about the 9%. I don't know what is our percent right now, our percentage. But we, are, um, we know there are a lot of activities going on and we want to be able to track our progress and set um, targets and ambition. But we're still uh, figuring out how can we find one KPI that the C-level suite can really understand to to measure circularity. And the last one is also an open question for you. I guess we don't have time, but you can also send me an email. What do you, where do you think we should focus? Should we, or maybe all of them? So is it about packaging, shifting from one way to only returnable bottle, or plastic fold to cardboard like we do in UK already? Eliminate plastic completely. Increase recycled content in our bottles or cans. Improve the recyclability in the countries where we operate and work with local infrastructure. Upcycle the, what we do with our organic co-products to feed the planet. Or work to raise awareness with our consumers. Or maybe other things that you think we should be doing. So looking forward as we are writing this new chapter to get input and your consumers, I hope, and you might be future employees. So we really value your input in this moment. And uh, yeah, that was my, my introduction. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> it is very interesting that you ask this question. So where should we start with? What yes. is the most important one? Because this is exactly what we always, or what I would ask you now, wh where do you start with? What can we also, um, what can we recommend small and medium-sized companies where to start with? So exactly this question. But we come later to yeah. this because first... And my email address is anne.dubost at heineken.com. I forgot to write it. But. 
so we have to uh, send it in, in the, maybe in the chat or so, yeah. Okay, so thank you. And we come to our last speaker, which is Thijs Martens from Philips today. Um, and he will be um, on screen or he will be online because he's un in Ant Antwerpen and he can't travel, of course. So welcome, Thijs Martens. Thais? Okay, now a technical problem occurs. <laughs> so we can do two things. We wait or we just start with a question hey. because we uh, are... Ik, uh, my computer crashed the whole time. I don't know what Okay, we can hear you now. We can all hear you, thanks. <laughs> Hello? Hello. We can hear you, but we don't see the presentation at the moment. No, that's, that's very... Um, well, every time you test these things and everything goes well, and then you dial in and um, everything goes wrong. So, unfortunately, and I can show you this, my future just <laughs> crashed, um, which is very unfortunate. Um, so my recommendation at this point is that, um, you know, we skip the presentation and move to the questions um, because, you know, I cannot be sharing anything at the moment. Uh, I just dialed in with my phone. Okay, yeah, we can do that. I'm terribly sorry, um, but uh, yeah, there's no other solution than that. Okay. Sonia? Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. But we have it. We it's have it right. now. We see your um, we see your presentation. So if you want to try again, we can click further, or I don't know which support you need. I don't. I don't see the presentation. So there's very little I can tell you. I don't know <laughs> which slides are showing. First slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you want to, you just um, uh, tell a little bit about the story and we will click further for you as soon as you say, yeah, show, um, show something. <laughs> yeah, so what I can say is that, um, you know, let's, let's, let, let me give a, a sort of a voiceover, right? So circular economy at Philips is, is very important um, to the company. It's really a, a driver for our overall strategy. And we're very uh, proud that circular economy, you know, we are recognized as a circular economy leader, generically speaking. If um, you look at our overarching mission, and, and, and you know, please bear with me uh, without uh, any guidance on the slide, but if you look at our overarching mission, we strive to make the world a healthier and more sustainable uh, place. And our goal is to really improve the lives of 3 billion people per year. Um, we are, obviously we are a health care company, so that's, you know, that's nicely aligned, but there's also a very strong link between human health and sustainability. You know, for example, about 16% of all global deaths are related to do uh, environmental pollution. And, you know, you have these uh, visions uh, or these pictures of pollution in front of you, like the ones that Roy just showed when I was still able uh, to, to witness what was going on. Um, but what is important here in the message I want to share is that circular economy is really central to our vision. And, um, you know, we as Philips, um, while expanding our ecological footprint, uh, we recognize that that's simply not sustainable in the way we are currently still partially organized and you know we see growing traction in the circular economy which uh, helps us decouple economic growth from the use of natural resources as was also you know touched upon by the other speakers um what in all transparency we want to share is that you know we put out in the world about 40,000 tons of hospital equipment and 200,000 tons of personal health appliances each year and we take this responsibility very seriously um you know, we want to create credibility by, um, you know, by taking responsibility on that equipment. And uh, we also want to use that opportunity to create new touch points with our customers and also learn from what our customers need in general. 
But if we translate that into sort of the central theme of this evening, which is also, you know, what are your targets and ambitions and what works for Philips? We at Philips for the year 2020, we have a target of 15% of circular um, revenues. So that means all revenues in Philips, 15% of that should come from circular products and services. And in addition to that, we have 90% of operational waste that is uh, being recycled and zero waste to landfill goals. Um, I think the most ambitious and also, let's say, progressive goal that we have is that uh, we have pledged to close the loop, which mean, means that we take back all large medical systems that become available to us, us uh, by the year 2025. And what is, um, or by the year 2020, sorry. And what is really interesting then is that in addition to that, we have extended that pledge to close the loop on all medical equipment by 2025. And um, just to illustrate, we treat our, for instance, our toothbrushes that uh, some of you might have in your household, we treat them as medical equipment. So we have pledged to take back and close the loop um, on all these, um, these toothbrushes by 2025. And you can imagine that's a, that's a very bold sort of ambition. And there's a lot of, you know, um, uncertainty, challenges, and complexity uh, involved in trying to reach those goals. So um, I'm very happy to be part of that journey. Um, just to try and, and paint the picture um, of how we address generically in, in the framework style um, the, um, the challenges related to this transition towards the circular economy, we are adopting um, um, you know, the four returning loops from uh, the Alan MacArthur Foundation that has also uh, been touched upon this evening. Um, so in terms of service, um, we try and um, deploy service business models, um, which will help us shift to uh, ownership, uh, from ownership to access. And we also, you know, have extended programs on maintenance and repair of equipment, um, which helps us to, um, you know, to to position products with customers that are repairable and serviceable and, um, you know, also uh, um, in some cases software upgrades could be available for such projects, well, products. If we think about refurbishment, I think a very typical and also more sort of tangible example of uh, value creation within a circular economy and also something that, uh, that uh, was previously touched upon during this, uh, this presentation today. Um, you know, we try to refurbish where possible. Um, and in doing so, we always make sure that, you know, for the parts that we cannot put back into the markets, we recover those parts and, um, you know, apply them in different products um, where possible. And of course, in line with the regulatory guidelines. Uh, finally, if we cannot put these parts back into any product that and we put out in the market as a refurbished system. Um, we recycle uh, these parts or components. And in, in doing so, we also try to recover value. Um, again, trying to give a brief voiceover of what we do and, and, and trying to come to a conclusion on that. We believe that the transition to a circular economy, you know, is just not just something we do because it's good for the environment, but we also see that the increasing um, demand for um, circular business in general. Um, you know, we see that through circular economy thinking, we can engage and, and, and retain customers, you know, through our business models. Um, we see new growth opportunities arising by, you know, making use of residual value and also, you know, reselling products or components. We see that we save costs because basically Circular economy means driving efficiencies across multiple use cycles. Uh, we also see a reduction of risk uh, that, um, that Roy slightly touched upon because we want to reduce the number of sort of risky behavior we, um, we engage in by um, you know, protecting ourselves against uh, scarcity and price volatility of resources, uh, but also prevent leakage of products and components to brokers um, and through the, the, for instance, the asset management of our large medical equipment. Uh, but we also, at the same time, want to increase recurring revenue streams um, uh, when, you know, engaging in circular business models. 
Uh, then sort of the people part, we and uh, me personally exact, uh, actually is, are very much attracted by the fact that we are so active within the circular economy and, and we identify ourselves as a perf purpose-driven company as well. Um, you know, in doing so, we believe that we offer new skill development to the people who work at Philips. And also, if you look internally, uh, for instance, to our community of practice, which is basically a digital platform for knowledge exchange, the sustainability and circular economy uh, community of practice is the biggest community of practice within Philips. Um, finally, you know, and that comes back to the collaborative advantage of a circular economy, um, is that we believe that, uh, you know, engaging in circular business practices, you know, really helps to strengthen our credibility uh, and establish uh, trust with customers. Uh, but it also helps us to be more engaged in our day-to-day. -day. And, um, you know, having said that and trying to come to a conclusion again, um, for me uh, personally, uh, being, a, uh, being involved in circular economy at Philips really makes me proud every day and I really enjoy my job. Um, circular economy is central to the vision of Philips. Um, you know, um, and maybe as a last uh, point of attention, we believe that engaging in circular business really helps us um, um, helps us understand what the what sort of the, the the new competitive advantage is of of this modern era, and that competitive advantage can basically be translated as a collaborative advantage. So we are no longer competing uh, on sustainability, but uh, the way we sort of try to position ourselves is, uh, is to, and, and to stay ahead of our competition is to make sure that we are uh, a company that is best equipped to collaborate with others. And that is really what the circular economy is about for, for me. Well, I'll conclude with that, and I hope there were some slides that matched my um, voiceover. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the in the in the coming uh, panel discussion. Thanks a lot for uh, bearing with me. Thank you very much, Thais. We didn't manage to show the presentation, but we could follow. <laughs> um, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Um, but perhaps we can just uh, uh, click through it to see the pictures now very briefly um, when I start asking questions now. Um, Bram, would you like to join on the podium? Because I'm not sure how to do this setting here because we only have three. Yeah? Sorry to interrupt. It's uh, my connection now with uh, Thais and Tamara. So Thais and Tamara will be visible on screen. It's, uh, and then so we can discuss the five of us. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, give us a second to yep. talk on and continue. Yep. We are uh, making connection now with both of them. Okay, so we will have um, two more persons in, in the discussion then. Um, but till this is fixed, I would like just to start because we have, I guess, a lot of questions now. It was very interesting to listen to all the stories. And um, I would like you, um, hello Tamara, <laughs> you are on the screen now, welcome. Um, I would like you, um, our audience, uh, also uh, to think of questions. So if you have a question, you can also ask. And also our online audience can ask questions via the chat function and we will um, uh, ask these questions later also. So, to start, um, we're waiting for Thais. Maybe there will be a split screen. I'm in. <laughs> I'm, you just don't see me, I'm in. Oh, you're in, okay. It's a pity that we can't see you. But, um, yeah, um, I would like to start with a question. Uh, we heard your stories of multinational big companies and Hello. <laughs> it seems like um, there is absolutely no question about the, um, about the transition to a circular economy because uh, it, it, 
sounds like you are on the way and you all work on this very hard and um, it, it is even quite optimistic what you tell us. It seems like um, we are on a good way to solve a lot of problems that we are facing with climate change and resource depletion and so on. Um, but uh, to really accelerate this way, what would you say is important now to say to small and mi middle-sized companies to join this way? Roy, would you like to start? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think also what Tamara maybe didn't show is that the circularity gap report was done in earlier years. And the gap, is, uh, the gap is not closing, so the gap is only growing. Um, and I think it's very important that all the companies, no matter how large or small, recognize that there's limits to the Earth's capacity. And climate change is one of the examples. The other one is, of course, related to resources. We extract more than, the, than this Earth can replenish. Also, we create a lot of waste. We don't use it in the right way. We burn it, it goes to landfill. Um, there's people that think that this problem will solve itself. And it will, but it's not in the, be it's not in the benefit of, of us, right? If, if the Earth is going to solve this problem, we're no longer here. So the only way to do this is all the companies start understanding that we need to make, ways, um, we need to make products in different ways. We need to start thinking about designing products in a different way. And we also need to start thinking about using different raw materials, more renewable ones, more bio-based ones. And all the companies have a valuable role to play as supplier, as a, uh, as a customer. Um, so I think it's the first step is to understand really that you're part of this, no matter if you like it, you're part of it. So very often um, we hear from companies that this first step is a problem because it is um, costly to change things, the business model or the, um, the way they produce. So what could be done to overcome this first step and to just start. W would you like again, uh, Roy? Or no, I, I think this might be a, a good question uh, for Thijs. Yeah. Philips. Thijs, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. No, totally. Um, so I think in, in terms of in, in terms of what um, small companies could do um, and but also large companies is is you actually already said it it's, it's just start to be honest so i think experimentation also in the field of sustainability uh, and and trying to test out how your customers uh, but also your internal teams are reacting to um, you know testing what sustainability could mean for you and circular economy could mean for you is is the best the best way forward. So I, th I think you, sustainability and circular economy is never going to be perfect, right? So it's going to be circular economy for you is going to be defined by the problems you want to address um, in circular economy. And therefore, I think the most important advice you can give to, to anybody is just to start and try to spot challenges that you would like to solve. Uh, that currently, you know, create waste or inhibit you from contribu contributing to creating a regenerative economy. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my advice. Can I can I add to that? Yes. Yeah, maybe one one advice also I would give them is maybe talk with your partners, uh, engage with your suppliers or your customers or the people you work with to understand how you can do it together because like we said, we can't do it alone. And thinking of us as Heineken, I see two groups. There is the, the small and medium sized enterprise we work with as our contractors, our suppliers, and their impact is our impact. So we engage with them, we work with them in order to together try to find new solutions. But then there are also those more innovator that where their whole business model is is built on circular economy that come to us and we need them to, to start new experiment, pilot and, and scale uh, innovation. And, uh, and we, we call for startups and scale ups to, to come to us because we don't develop all the ideas in house and we need, uh, we need them to give us these ideas. 
Um, I think we have a lot of um, companies in our network asking for um, support how to start this process. Um, maybe Bram, do you um, think that Fontys um, as an educational institution has a, maybe a bigger role in this to transfer knowledge to companies who are now in the position to start this? Um, it, it's, it's absolutely a, a role that we would like to, to have. Yeah, and because uh, we are a university of applied sciences, so that means that we uh, have, uh, of course, the ambition to educate the students for the careers of the future, but also to help the companies in our region to uh, keep on innovating. And uh, I, in my presentation, I said we just started the business innovation learning lab. Um, that is a total shift in the way we do our education. Students in the business innovation learning lab, the only thing they do, only quote unquote, is working with projects, working on projects for companies. And there are no teachers teaching, there are teachers coaching the students in those projects. So we work with companies who have ideas, typically small and medium sized enterprises. They have ideas, they want to take steps, but they don't know how to do it. They don't have the capacity to do it. They don't have the people to do it because they have their day-to-day -day business. They don't have the long-term perspective of strategies like companies like uh, we have as guests here, but they're small to medium-sized enterprises. So we think these two ambitions really come together where we have the opportunity to get uh, students to work on innovation assignments, specifically in this field. We get a lot of requests. Uh, it also helps us to prepare them for the future and to develop the small and medium-sized enterprises in the region. So, yes. Yes. Um, do you agree on that we have a lot of knowledge and technology to really do the change already and that a bottleneck is to transfer this knowledge and technologies? Maybe was, was that a question? Maybe Tamara? <laughs> Can you hear us, Tamara? Or, yeah? Did yes, hi. <laughs> okay. We're finding the unmute button. <laughs> and, well, I, I definitely think that there's a, a, a something where we can indeed probably do more. So. Again, coming back to the, it's about collaboration and finding each other. And well, also, a, I think a popular word that we use is how can we scale this? Because I think it's also been shared in the very insightful presentations by the, by the businesses. Like there's often a lot of, well, employees or, or students or whatever who want to work on this topic, but that indeed the challenge is how can we find each other and make sure that good ideas um, come together uh, and so maybe to also make the tangible how we as an organization are, some, are also working on this is that, for example, we have this online knowledge hub. Uh, and I know that the European Commission has something like that as well, where it's also about sharing examples, how we can learn from each other. So I definitely think that if we can make a, a leap there and find each other more and be more open in collaboration. So I really also appreciate how you as companies basically share your challenges so openly and invite everyone to join. And that, that is a, definitely a good example of what I think is necessary uh, for the circular economy to scale. So a lot about uh, collaboration and um, the uh, networking, so getting all, all into the boat. Um, your very nice examples of, uh, for example, the carpet. Um, I was thinking of, um, we already know now a technology, how to recycle this carpet 100%, no waste, 100% circul circularity. So who is producing it and selling it? So what will be the next steps to really make it big? Is IKEA asking for it or is, is somebody, uh, some big companies producing it already? 
That's a very, uh, that's a very good question. And actually, this is a, this is a funny example because I was just mentioning DSM is an ingredient brand. And mainly what we do is we sell ingredients. So we would sell this technology to carpet manufacturers. And this is an example where we show, saw that the industry was not picking up fast enough. So actually what we're doing, and this is the first time ever for DSM, we're selling directly to the customer. So we are now showing the customer that it's possible to get a fully recyclable carpet, and we're building a business model around it. Not because we want to be in the carpet, because it's really not a core business, but because we want to show the industry that it is possible. So this is an example, and, and you, you couldn't know because it wasn't part of, uh, of, my, um, of my introduction, but this is actually an example where we actually go beyond and, and maybe step in into the unknown for DSM in a whole new terrain and start selling carpet, yeah. So I have a question for Bram now. We are rebuilding our um, Fontis building and um, there is a lot of material <laughs> necessary. So um, would it be um, an option to think about these materials and um, is, is that something we as uh, role model perhaps should do? That's, that's a very, very good question. And uh, that makes me think that in practice, uh, you really need to make a shift in your thinking in really doing it. And that's why I'm also, because I'm, I'm not at all involved, but I think the, 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 the city hall here in Venlo is such a very, very relevant uh, example because everything in there is labeled as it can be reused for this and for this and for this. Coming back to your question, we just did some upgrades over the summer break, as we always do. I honestly didn't check. So this is something relevant to put on the agenda for next time. Thank you. Marco, please put it on the agenda. <laughs> I have a question for um, Anne. Um, we as consumers, if we want to choose a more sustainable circular product, how can we know that this one is better than this one? How can we know that Heineken is better than anything else? By, by being here today? <laughs> no, but yeah, there is no, no official metric, no comparison, even on carbon footprint, which is kilogram of CO2, so it's maybe easier to measure, but still, there is no, there are some at them, there is science-based target, but it's not easy to compare the carbon footprint of product A and B in a supermarket. But, um, um, yeah, there is work to be done in this uh, direction and, uh, and like, yeah, we, we try to work together also within our sector to make the sector move forward. But then if you, if you drink a beer and you want to drink it the most sustainable, you should go to a bar and take a beer from the tap. That's, that's the best. And if not, because of uh, Corona measures, you have to do it at home, then get a returnable bottle and then bring it back uh, to the supermarket. That's the next best, let's say. Can I ask a question about this? Sure, yeah. <laughs> a few decades ago, all beer bottles were the same. And it didn't matter what brand you bought. You could just return it to the supermarket. And suddenly there has been a shift where I have to check every time, is this a beer bottle that I can return or not? And uh, Heineken yeah. looks different from other brands. Why is that? Yes, so on the, there are still a lot of uh, bottles that are the same, including some of our products that are the same as our competitors' uh, bottles. So we, can, we have the same. Heineken, for example, is different. Uh, it's green glass. Uh, other brands are also green glass. But the, the collection system and the retailers are organized in such a way that we can uh, easily channel back to the right place where they should go. Then on the returnable versus non-returnable, yeah, ideally we would go to 100% returnable. The zero zero is returnable now also. But, um, but yeah, some people still like the convenience of having a one-way bottle because they don't have to bring it back. Uh, so if all of you start only buying returnable, maybe someday we don't need the, the one-way bottle and we can only have returnable. But it's to offer the choice uh, to the people. That's why we have both now. But what we see is um, also the consumer has a big responsibility in this. And um, Roy mentioned in his um, 
uh, presentation the role of the consumer. Consumers are aware now, they want to perhaps um, uh, have more sustainable products, but they need to know how to also. So it's maybe both sides who have to do more in this. We have questions um, in the, uh, here live, but also I want to start with an online question. Um, Katie has collected some. Yes, hello everyone. So we have two questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is, is there a perspective for startups or for existing waste disposal companies that are coming up with solutions for a circular process in products, services? It's for, it's a general question for all the speakers, so it's not intended for anyone specifically. I can try to, uh, to answer the question. I think it's, it's really important um, uh, that we underline that role for those companies. And the reason why I say that is if you look at, for instance, DSM, we are a producer. So we, we pretty well know how to make our own material. And there is examples, for instance, Dyneema, it's the world's strongest yarn. Um, is as strong it can stop a bullet. And it's, it's a, as, as strong as steel, seven times lighter. Um, so if you combine it, you can imagine how difficult it is to, to recycle that. DSM is, not, DSM is not a recycling company. We're not a collector, we're not a sorter. But we want to actually get that material back. We want to reuse it again. So we need startups, we need innovative ideas, we need, um, uh, it can be small, it can be ideas, we need anything to help us because that's not the core business. And we don't want to be that. We don't want to be a recycler or a collector, but we do want to close the loop. So I think it's really important that those companies come forward and if they have ideas actually to, to go to multinationals and say, I have a solution for you. I can help you solve your problem and get your product back or maybe help you recycle or have a technology that makes it easier for us to separate it. So I think it's a very good question and absolutely valid. And we are looking for those companies. Yeah, and maybe uh, I can add because I think there were two players mentioned, the, the traditional waste management company, the Renewi and Veolia and Suez, and then the startups. And, uh, and I can say for Heineken, we, we have innovation projects and we are in dialogue with both these players actually. And, and the, the big waste management company are also reinventing themselves and also moving in that direction. So, so both have a role to play and we can work with any idea from either side. And the second one is, is the circular economy exclusive only for companies which produce products or services? I would say that's something for ties. <laughs> or Tamara, ties, do you hear us? Maybe not or we can't hear you. Tamara, would you like? <laughs> I found the unmute button quicker this time. So uh, I definitely think that the, the circular economy is basically for everyone and anyone. Uh, but because I can imagine that maybe for products it sounds very tangible, but in the end uh, also for governments it's a concept that's very relevant because they are now often, at least for example in the Netherlands, of course the ones who help us in providing the waste management structure or let's call it resource management structure um, and but I guess that what's below this is that it could also yeah it also definitely accounts for accountants for example we also need them to be involved uh, in this so I would say it's for everyone yeah, may okay. maybe to add to that and and it wasn't really part of the presentation but um, I think what's important to underline is that governments are moving that direction so the Dutch government, they actually claimed already that they want to be 100% circular by 2050. If you look at the EU Commission, their new Green Deal, they're going to invest another 1,000 billion in climate as part of the Green Deal, and circular economy is their number one priority. So this is happening. It's no longer just a talk. It's actually part of plans, part of legislation. So circular economy is going to import, be important for many, many different sectors. So think about it. What will be your role? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. 
Uh, maybe. There's one more. <laughs> Sorry, it just came up. So it's for Roy specifically. Uh, to what length is DSM working with product designers to co-create a circular world around them? And if not, um, are they interested in doing so? Yeah, so we, we are absolutely interested in doing so. Um, at DSM, first of all, uh, a large part of the workforce is actually in innovation. So we continue to uh, reinvent ourselves, and you already saw that it's a company through evolution. We started to reinvent ourselves, come up with new production products and new ideas. So that's largely done in-house, but especially for circular economy, we connect um, with, uh, with universities, we connect with, uh, with other uh, knowledge partners like circle economy because I think it's important to look beyond ourselves. Sometimes we need that out-of-the-box idea. So I'm not sure who is sending the idea, but if you have a great idea, always welcome. Thank you very much. We are completely running out of time. I didn't know, but we have, of course, to ask the audience for at least one question. And I promise you, after this session, we meet in the hall and we all have time to briefly talk um, about your questions. But let's, I, I'm not sure who was the first to, um, <laughs> and, and I'm also not sure how to manage the, uh, the micros uh, or, Maybe it's also loud enough if, if you um, speak up a little bit. Please. see that tomorrow as a, let's say, a investigator or making a report and stuff. I don't think sustainability is, uh, is, is, is something that is uh, common under people and there are a lot of false claims. So what can we do about that? So people don't really understand what sustainability is, is, uh, is uh, like. It was for Tamara, right? I guess so. Yeah. Could you hear? Could you hear us? Uh, oh, sorry. Was that a question for me? No, I can't. Yeah, it was a question for you. <laughs> the question was, what, is, um, what do you think about all the false claims? Because um, the public is not so informed about sustainability and they, are, um, they, they get a lot of maybe um, confusing and false uh, claims in this direction. What do you think about that? So about what? About the corals, I hear? False, False. claims. Right. So, so um, confusing. Oh, goals or claims. Well, yeah, that immediately makes me... So what we sometimes speak about at, uh, at my organization is how, how indeed can we bring this more into the, let's say, the, day, the daily news? Because sometimes I feel that everyone is talking about circular economy every day, but then already with friends and family, I know that that's uh, not the case because it's such a concept. Like, what if we would speak about it every day in the Jeugdjournal or like the, so the, the daily news show targeted at kids because that would also make us speak about it in, easy, uh, in an easy, comprehensible language. Because I think also a lot of things that we do already are uh, circular. Uh, and I know that in Germany, apparently, there's been a request to now have every, every day five minutes ahead of the, let's say, regular news, five minutes for the climate. So it would be cool if we could do something like that in the Netherlands to indeed make it more mainstream and involve everyone in the conversation. If we really mean it, that there's a role for business, consumers, universities, everyone, uh, then indeed we should also talk about it more. Thank you very much. I think that's um, a nice closing word now. Um, I think one more. Okay, you decide. <laughs> Thank you uh, all uh, uh, companies for the very motivational uh, uh, presentation just now. 
it motivates you really to uh, get onto the topic, so to speak. So thank you for that. Thank you for your commitment to the world and not only to your company uh, to make such uh, wonderful progress. But <laughs> uh, actually, as a red line through all the presentations and all the, the speakers of now, uh, water is one of the resources that is very important to all of you. And the next issue, is, so I want to address circular water, if I may say so. So could I put this onto your agenda and to your topic of mind? Because we are scarce of water. We people consist uh, for 80% uh, of water, as I heard. So water is very important for all of us and for your products as well. Well, I don't need to address uh, Heineken for that. It's 95 percent. Yeah, 95 percent. <laughs> um, the next topic is uh, uh, actually aligning uh, Tamara. Um, uh, it concerns us all. But how do we manage to bring all these inspirational industrial topics onto the local society? The local society means that there is no distribution necessary if you can bring it onto local. And as we are here to gathered in the statue of Law and Plaisir, how do you involve us to make it as local as possible? That's actually my question and my remark. I think it's um, not possible, but I would like to ask you to to answer very brief and, and short, because uh, the rest of the discussion is for later then. <laughs> Can I start? Yeah. Yeah, on, the, on, the, on your first point on water, you say it's the next topic. For us, it was already, water has been uh, in the core of our business and our focus forever, because it's 95% of our product, because we, we use more water than this 95%, so we can't, how many hectoliters of water we need to make one hectoliter of beer. And uh, we have a, a strategy, it's called Every Drop, uh, where we focus on water efficiency, so reducing this hectoliter per hectoliter, but also water circularity, so we have wastewater treatment plants in almost all our breweries, and we work on the quality of the effluent after the wastewater to make sure we send back the water as good as we took it. And the third one is water balancing, to restore the watershed underground. So this is our triangle and, and there is a, yeah, a very thorough work and uh, ambitions already set for 2030 and we, we have a lot of focus on that. Especially because we have today 20 breweries in water scarce area and in 2030 it will be 30 breweries because new water scarce area come every day. So especially these ones we even focus more there. And we work, like you say, it's a very local problem. So we work a lot with the local communities to work on water balancing, restoring the, the watershed, etc. versus climate and CO2 emissions, which are much more cross-border problem, in a way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess you covered both questions. Um, and the rest needs to be discussed uh, later um, with a drink in the hall. So for now, I say thank you to our audience. Thank you also to the online audience. And thank you very much for all our speakers to be here. Uh, it was really interesting to listen to your stories and your insights. So thank you very much. Um, I have to um, give advice how to leave this room. So you only um, may go outside in th on this side into the hall and um, then you uh, need to sit at the tables because of Corona so we are not allowed to stand around. Thank you and see you in the hall. Secure another
Step into my time.